you very much, Pastor Fred. Thank you, Two Mountains People's Church, for uh, inviting me and allowing me to uh, be here with you this morning. Uh, it is an honor and a, a pleasure to be here. Um, we've had a, at Cape Ray, Quebec, we've had a long standing relationship with uh, the church, as uh, has already been mentioned. Um, and now that we've gotten rid of Matt, I get the invite. So that's <laughs> We do still get the odd visit from Matt, and, uh, and uh, he sends his greetings too. I was speaking with him a while ago and mentioned that I was going to be sharing here, and so he sends his greetings. And um, So yeah, it's, it, as I said, it is uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here with you this morning and, and opening the Lord's Word uh, together and asking him what he might have for us and how he might challenge us, challenge us and call us deeper into our uh, walk with him. And so, um, so yeah, this morning... Uh, we're looking at uh, Genesis 15, uh, verses 1 to 6. Uh, so I'm just going to read that. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? Since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity that you placed before us to, uh, to open your word together. We know that uh, faith comes through hearing, and hearing the word of the Lord. And so uh, we pray, Father, that as we uh, read your word this morning, as we examine what it says, that you would increase in us the faith that you require of us. We hand this time over to you and we pray this through Jesus. Amen. Um, at, uh, at Cape and Ray, Quebec, so we, we run a, a Bible school program and uh, we have a, a number of young people who come in and uh, during the first week of school we do a number of uh, trust exercises with our students. And uh, in these trust exercises we give the students an opportunity to trust one another. And uh, one of the things we do is we, we find a high platform and we'll have the students stand, uh, one, one student stand on the platform and turn around uh, with their back to the rest of the students. And, uh, and we'll say to them, okay, uh, it's time for you to trust your fellow students, your peers, uh, and, and just lean back and fall. And they're going to catch you. And uh, oftentimes we get, uh, a lot of our student body is made up of young girls <laughs> and they, they turn and they're like jake can you do that can you stand there please i'm like no 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 you have to trust your your fellow students you have to put your trust in them uh and, and you have to allow them uh, to catch you and, uh, and one of the other uh, exercises that we do is um we take them rock climbing uh, we have uh, a friend of the ministry who's a, um, a very accomplished rock climber and uh, and a believer as well, and so he ties in some of the spiritual principles that um, that, that we need to uh, believe <laughs> as we walk in the Lord, and, and, and he helps them to understand um, how the rock climbing system uh, resembles the faith journey as well. And so when you're when you're harnessed in to the to the system, and you've got the rope, and you're attached, and there's somebody at the bottom of the rope, and they're they're holding. Uh, the weight and, and they're, um, they're controlling your descent, you have to trust in the system. And so we'll have the students climb up a, a ways up the wall and then we'll say, okay, now we want you to let go. <laughs> let go of the wall. And this is when they actually have to place their trust in this system. And they, they're asking, we're asking them, do you trust the system? And when they let go, they see that the system works. But in order for the system to work, they need to let go. They need to actually place their trust in the system so that they can allow it to do uh, its job. 
we see in this passage this morning that God is in the middle of taking Abram on a trust exercise. Very similar to uh, the trust exercises that uh, we take our students on. And, and this trust exercise actually begins much earlier in the text. And actually, uh, the story of Abram goes back before Abram is even mentioned in the text. We look in Genesis chapter 11, is when this all kind of starts to take place. We see uh, there's the Tower of, of Babel. And we have this group of people, and they're saying, to, they're saying, let us make a name for ourselves. We're going to do this thing. We're going to build this uh, great civilization, this city, and this tower. Uh, or structure, uh, and it's going to reach the heavens, but it's all in the attempts to make a name for themselves. And then after that story, we see the call uh, of Abram. And, and God says to Abram, I want you to leave this place. And, and what does he say to him? He says, I will make a name for you. And then we see journey, uh, the journey of Abram as he follows God, uh, and, and he's beginning to grow as a people group through uh, through the, the people in his extended family and servants and, um, and, and we see that he is growing into uh, this people group but he's realized that he doesn't have a son he's growing old he doesn't have somebody to pass this on to and Abram asks a question and God takes Abram outside and asks him to look at the stars. When we look at this passage, we ask, we, we ask ourselves, why is, why is God saying to Abram, look at the stars? And, and there's an answer given to us in the text. Uh, the stars cannot be numbered, right? And, and, and so this is a symbol of the, the number of descendants that Abram will have. Abram's offspring will be that numerous God says. And so, uh, so we see this as God speaking of uh, the, the number of descendants that Abram will have. But I think when we look at the text, we see that there's also another symbol there. There's another symbol that we can see uh, in this looking at the stars. And I believe that this is um, a truth that we can see about God and his promise. See, Abram is asking God if he's still planning on, on keeping his promise. He's saying, God, my name, my name is Great Father. Abram means Great Father, but I don't have any kids. I'm getting old, God. I, I trust your promise, but I don't see how. And this isn't so much doubt as a type of uncertainty because of these things, because of his name being Great Father, because God has said, I will make a great nation of you, but he's not seeing the promise fulfilled. And it's been quite some time. And so God responds by saying, look at the stars. When, when um, my family and I, when we moved to Cape and Quebec, the, in the... Um, the month before we, we actually came, we, we came for a visit, and uh, it's kind of an, just a, an opportunity for us to uh, get comfortable with the place again and uh, to give our kids an experience, to get them kind of excited about the move. And so um, we, were, we stayed in the house that we live in now, and um, there, were, there were actually no beds there. We, just, uh, we were sleeping on, uh, on mattresses on the floor, and, uh, and there was nothing really in the house, but it was a place for us to stay. And I remember that the first night that we were there, uh, my wife woke up in the middle of the night, and, uh, and she came, she, she went, I guess, to get a drink of water, to wash it, and, and she came back and she got me, she said, Jay, you gotta, you gotta see this. I'm like, what? I got, okay. Uh, and so she, she brought me over to the, uh, one of the bedrooms, and in this bedroom, we live on a lake, uh, on our property, and, and so our, our house overlooks the lake, and uh, this one bedroom has the best view of the lake, and as I walked into the room, the room was so bright, and we looked out, and all you could see were the stars in the sky, and they were reflecting off of the lake. There were so many stars, they were filling the sky, and they were reflecting off the lake, and we were just in awe, we were, and we saw that as 
uh, as God speaking to us about what he was calling us to uh, in the ministry that he was placing uh, before us. But I remember being just overwhelmed by the presence of so many stars and how beautiful they are. And, and we regularly have students who come to us uh, who have been uh, in other parts of the world that were, or cities uh, where they've come from and, and they've never seen stars quite like we have at Cape Ray, Quebec. Stars the war. God is saying something about his promise through the stars though. When are the stars in the sky? Sorry? At night. At night? Are the stars in the sky right now? <laughs> see, we look up in the, star, in the sky at night and we see the stars. And we see that they're there. But right now, the sky is filled with stars. I have a, an app on my phone, it's called Starfinder, and uh, you, can, you take, take the phone and you hold it up and, and it shows you what constellations are in the sky depending on where you're looking. And, um, and the neat thing is, if, if you look at this screen, there's this black line or this, this black section below the line, and that's actually the horizon. And so when I'm looking at the, at, at the stars with the phone, I can look below the horizon and say, oh, okay, there's a, that's where that constellation is or that planet. Uh, oh, look, the moon is there, and I can see the trajectory of the moon. But it shows you where all of the stars are, even when they're not visible. See, we may not always see the stars, but they're always there. And I think that when God is saying to Abraham, Abram, look at the stars. See, Abram is questioning God's promise. And God says, look at the stars. And he's saying to Abram, you may not see the promise. You may not see evidence of the promise, but it's still there. And just like the stars aren't going anywhere, either is my promise. Isaiah says uh, in chapter 55, Verses uh, 10 and 11. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. God said to Abram, my promise is still there. And Abram believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. God has taught Abram a very important lesson here. And it's a lesson that we need to uh, take note of. And it's a lesson that I need to be reminded of regularly. God is reminding Abraham that our circumstances don't dictate God's ability to fulfill his promises. Our circumstances do not dictate God's ability to fulfill his promises. We may find ourselves in very difficult circumstances. In fact, we will find ourselves in very difficult circumstances. Circumstances. When we're speaking of promises, there's a promise that Jesus tells us. He says, in this world you will have troubles, but I have overcome the world. See, it's going to get tough. You're going to get sick. You're going to experience heartbreak. As my family is finding out, you'll lose loved ones too early. You'll be challenged. You'll be wrongfully accused. You experience great difficulties. And in the midst of all that, God says, I won't change. How we respond to these circumstances tells us about our faith. Mm -hmm. See, we can get discouraged. 
We can complain. We can give up on God. We can look for ways that we might want to change our circumstances. We start spinning the wheels. What am I going to do? How am I going to, how am I going to change this? Or we can operate, as the Bible tells us, in God's will, which is to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that you're not unhappy. That doesn't mean that you're not pained greatly by difficult circumstances. But what we're called to do is to rejoice in the midst of that, to trust in the Lord, to trust in his promise. See, God calls us to apply what we know about him to our circumstances. When we apply what we know about God, sorry, when we apply what we know about our circumstances to God, we are saying God's not big enough. And we start to ask, what can I do? We start to look for solutions. We start to look for a way out. But when we apply what we know about God to our circumstances, we're saying God is in control. He's got this. And then we start to ask a much different question. I wonder what God is going to do in the midst of this. I wonder what, what he's up to. I wonder how he's going to glorify himself. And that's what it means to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing and in all things to give thanks. We're not thanking God for the cancer. We're not thanking God for the unemployment. We're not thanking God for the heartache or the loss or the difficulties. But we're thanking him for how he is going to glorify himself in the midst of this. And that's where we see God's call over and over throughout Scripture to wait on Him. Psalm 37, verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalm 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He turned to me and heard my cry. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. So Abram believed in the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abram still hasn't seen the evidence at this point. He hasn't seen the evidence. He's trusting in God's promise. If, if, if Abram's question was, hey God, is there anything I can do here? It's obvious that God's response is, no, I got this. I'm okay. And Abram's response to that is, okay. All right. And that's righteousness. We often have a different view of what righteousness is. But we see in this passage that it's simply to take God at his word and to trust in him. It's important for us to realize as well that what, what Abram is trusting, what, what Abram is believing about God is about so much more than just the birth of a child. And yes, there is, there is this ex expectation uh, that it's going to come by way of uh, the birth of a child, but it's so much bigger than this. As I said earlier, it, this story actually starts in Genesis chapter 11 where the people of Babel, Babylon, they said this phrase, let us make a name for ourselves. When we see after that encounter, we see the call uh, of Abram. In chapter 12, God says to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, 
and curse anyone who treats you with contempt. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. If you pay attention in that passage, you'll see that God says, I will, six times. In a culture whose primary concern is making a name for oneself, God has promised that he will do the name making. It's easy for us to look at Babel and, and say, well, look at them and, and look at how they were so concerned about themselves and making a name for themselves. Our culture is very similar. Mm -hmm. We live in this constant pursuit of wealth, of stature, stat status. You gotta have the house, you gotta have the car, you gotta have the 2.5 kids. I don't understand that. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Um, stability. What about my retirement? What about the job? What? How are we going to pay the bills this month? And, and sometimes we're we're even tempted when we can't pay the bills to portray ourselves as though we can do even more. We have this pressure to portray a certain image. This, this whole uh, social media phenomenon that requires us to, to put forth our best selves so that everyone can press like. The image that we portray in church In what ways are we caught up in making a name for ourselves? In what ways do we need to be reminded that God is saying, I will do the name making? And the name that he's making is his. He'll do it through you. If you'll allow him. The, um, the word that's used here uh, in the Hebrew for uh, for believe is um, it, it's likened to placing all of your weight upon putting all of your weight upon uh, oftentimes used as well in, in terms of pillars so the these side beams over here uh, all of the weight of the building is resting on these pillars Uh, it, it's, it's likened to being firm and unmoving. So believing then is putting all of your weight upon the promise of God. Abram not only believed wholly in the promise of God, but more importantly, he believed in the God of the promise. The God of the promise is worthy of placing our weight off. I had that on the slide. I didn't realize that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Which chair would you choose to sit on? We talk about trust exercises. If I had these two chairs here and I called Fred up and I said, okay, Fred, take a seat, which one is he going to choose? Fred, just three of You're going to choose the one that is obviously capable of doing the job. So how is God calling you to put your weight on him? Are there obstacles? Are there uh, demands that seem difficult? His demands? Do his demands seem difficult? Are the evidence, is the evidence of his promise difficult to see at this point in time? Maybe you find yourself in a situation and you've been, you've been hanging on to this promise and you're not seeing it. And you're asking, is this really from God? That's a good question to ask. And you should be examining that regularly. When you find yourself saying, yes, it is from God, continue to trust, continue to rest in Him. Continue to put your weight on Him. 
even when your circumstances are somehow suggesting that he's not capable. Will you put your weight on him and walk in righteousness? This, this verse, Abram believed the Lord uh, and he credited to him as righteousness. It's used a number of times throughout uh, the New Testament as well. Uh, Peter uses it when he's uh, uh, addressing uh, the crowds. Paul uses it a number of times. Uh, James uses it. And it's regularly uh, referencing this correlation or this tension between faith and works. Often, it's addressing a, a Jewish audience who had placed their faith in their ability to follow the law in their works. That they have been uh, looking for how they can live up to and establish their own righteousness by following the laws. This is the first use of the word righteousness, and it's preceding the law by 400 years, more than 400 years. The law doesn't even exist. And God credits Abram's action, or, well, action of belief mm -hmm. as righteousness. Abram's righteousness precedes the law. <coughs> when we look at the law, the expectations, the things that we think that we need to do in order to be, be righteous. It's important that we remember how Abram was credited as righteousness. Mm -hmm. See, at this point in time, Abram did nothing other than to say, yes, Lord. Abram's only action is agreement with the Lord. And that's enough. The work of the Lord is to agree with him. The righteousness that is reckoned to Abram by God is not attainable by humanity. And this is, this is actually, when we look at the law, we look at uh, what was given uh, to, the, to the Jewish people it's regularly to point to Christ because it's not attainable. It's completely unattainable. And actually, Scripture tells us that it's unattainable. Isaiah, in, in Isaiah 64, verse 4, he says, For all of us has become like one who is unclean, and the righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There's actually some very graphic language that he's using there to talk about our own attempts at righteousness. The attempts that we make to be righteous. Matthew chapter 19. We see um, an encounter that Jesus has with a young man. Starting in verse 16, it says, Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He asked him. Jesus answered, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving, because he had many possessions. Now I could spend 45 minutes talking about this passage, and I'm not going to, but we see something very interesting going on here because the rich young ruler comes to Jesus thinking, I'm pretty good. And Jesus gives him a list. 
And he says, well, good enough. What else? It's interesting, in this list, Jesus leaves out the first two commandments, which are that you shall uh, not have any other gods before him, or worship false gods, idols. And here is this rich young ruler who has been putting his trust in his wealth. He's placed his wealth as a god in his life. And Jesus says to him, you got to get rid of that. But when he's looking at his, his own righteousness, he sees himself as living up to the righteousness. And the, the disciples pick up on this a little bit later. In verse 25 it says, When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and asked, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. With God all things are possible. The other interesting thing, when we're looking at this rich young ruler and his belief that he's lived up to these things, that he's, you know, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. He's like, oh yeah, no problem, I've got it, I'm good. You know, I haven't done any of those things. But earlier in the book of Matthew, Jesus talks about, he says, you have heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you, any of you who have uh, thought of another brother and said, you fool, you've already committed murder. All right. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery, but if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, then you've already committed adultery with her. I think that if this rich young ruler were to do a, an honest assessment of his life and his ability to keep the law, he might say, mm, okay, I can't do this. I can't do this. And you know, that's where Jesus meets us. Jesus meets you and I in the, I can't do this. In fact, he calls us to the, I can't do this. That's the promise. It sounds ridiculous, but the promise of God is that you can't do this. But he can. The founder of Cape Mary Bible Schools and Torchbearers International has a, a famous quote of his where he found himself at a place where he had to say, God, I can't do this. And you never said that I could. But you can. And you always said that you would. And that's the promise that God calls us to rest in. God is saying to Abram and also to you and I, I've got this. And the life that he's calling us into in response to his I've got this is agreement. Yes, Lord. The righteousness that the Lord seeks from you and I is yes, Lord. And when we submit to him in that, and when we allow him to do his work in and through our lives, We see great things. We see him making a name for himself. This is the life that Jesus calls us to when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. The fullest life that we can live as a Christian is to allow God to accomplish his purposes in and through our lives. Resting in his goodness, resting in his promise, taking him at his word, and walking forward in what he places before us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that even when the evidence of your promise doesn't seem visible, we know that it still exists, that it's still there and we can trust in him, and we can walk in him. And we can join Paul when he says to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and in all circumstances to give thanks. 
and know that as we're doing that, that we are walking in your will for our lives. Dependence, complete and total dependence on your ability to do your work in and through us. Father, we confess this morning that so many times we've done the opposite. Father, there may be some here this morning who are recognizing that they're currently doing the opposite. Remind us of your faithfulness, Lord. Call to mind the many ways that you've proven yourself capable. Let us join with the psalmist and, and bless the Lord with all that is within us. And forget not all of your benefits, Lord. Help us to regularly count our blessings. Count the blessings of those around us and recognize that that is your work and it's evidence of your promise. Help us to live the life of dependence that you call us to and create us through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.